retrofits. And we have gotten 150 uh, homes retrofitted, 170 in progress. The goal is 1,000 uh, by the end of the three-year grant. That is 5 percent of the entire housing stock in Rutland County. So it is a big deal for us. And uh, it is saving the homeowners about $913 a year. That is real money uh, in Rutland County. All right. And when I was there, I got a tour of actual work that was being done in some of these old buildings. And I was also at a class where we had scores of local contractors who were getting updated on what they could do to get basically in the market. So I just want to cite that. It is not Solyndra scale, but it is real world scale in, uh, in, in Rutland, Vermont. It has got local people in the, doing the administration. It has got local homeowners who are lining up to get uh, the opportunity to retrofit their homes and save them money. And it has got local contractors who are desperately uh, looking for work. So let me just ask you, I want to say thank you. That is working. Uh, Secretary Solis, can you tell me uh, if in your survey it, it is the case that it is the construction workers that are probably getting hit harder or as hard as any other sector in our economy and how this uh, plan might be helpful to them? It is very true. In fact, we have uh, in the audience here some individuals who represent the business industry and apprenticeships where they are retrofitting uh, commercial buildings and homes. And we have individuals here that are also working in other segments in, in say, hospital care, where they are learning to conserve and reuse and, and uh, provide other efficiencies. Efficiency is one of the definitions that the BLS right. has outlined. So yes, it falls very much in line with that. And we are going to see more jobs like that created. We are making the transition from blue collar to green. And that is what it is. So it still could be very intensive manufacturing, construction, yes. But there is a new, there is a new um, component to it. And last year when I served on Energy and Commerce uh, with you, uh, Mr. Barton was extremely helpful in trying to push energy efficiency. And I hope we can find some common ground and do that here. So uh, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Langford is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And thanks for being here in the conversation. You know this is a big deal. Obviously, as we're tracking jobs, it's important to us on how it's done and what and how we classify it. And, and, and th this is a new category that has been created of green jobs. And obviously, you all are struggling through how to define whether if someone changes from an incandescent bulb to uh, a, a, a fluorescent bulb, now they're suddenly a green job. Where last week, they were a janitorial job. Now they're a green job, janitorial job. I mean, it's all those dynamics fit into this as we are trying to find a clear definition to really get a real handle on what this is. And uh, so I appreciate the, your work that you are doing on that. Uh, press on on it because we will want to have a good definition that we can all agree upon at the end of the day to be able to determine where all these dollars are going. Uh, Mr. Pullman, let me ask you as well about clean energy. How are you defining? Is there a list that is working from the Department of Energy? These are clean energy sources? No, we don't do it that way, uh, uh, Congressman. We, we are trying to build the future. We are trying to build out, as uh, your colleague was saying, all of our energy resources, absolutely including those that have uh, no and low carbon uh, and uh, everything from nuclear and hydro right. through the renewables. And, okay, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm assuming solar is a clean energy, wind is a clean energy, yes. hydroelectric clean energy, yes. uh, biofuels. Uh, would uh, geothermal be considered a clean energy source? Yes. Um, natural gas use. It is uh, better than coal because, of course, it only has half of the greenhouse gas emissions. So that is a you know th that is a significant improvement in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions. Based on where we are with research and the progress we're making in the next 20 years, could we be at a spot 20 years from now on our current trend and where things are moving to have 80 percent of America's energy be produced by clean sources? Electricity. We believe the President has called for this. By 2035, we can have 80 percent of our electricity from clean sources. Yes. And where would you define clean sources? Is that natural gas power plants, solar, wind? Well, where where well, is that coming from? We, you, you, obviously, anything that has zero carbon emissions, uh, that, that counts completely. And then, for example, if something has half the greenhouse gas emissions of coal, as natural gas does, as a matter of logic, I would impute that much credit right. well, to it. You, and and that is the challenge, is that obviously he's called for that in the, in the State of the Union uh, address. Uh, the, the challenge then is how do we define what energy sources are in, what is out on that one? Uh, so at this point, has it been defined? This is the clean energy source, so that this is going to be included in that 80 percent target. I, I think what, when we contemplate getting the 80 percent, it would give that kind of credit to natural gas, as well as, uh, of course, the carbon-free uh, sources would would be counted as well. What, what about solar? What percentage do you think of electricity will be produced by solar 20 years from now? 
It depends. We have the SunShot initiative. We're trying to drive down costs over so the levelized cost of electricity from solar is, is the same. We think it's growing. We have 887 megawatts that went in last year. That was double the year before, 435. So it's, it's going up. Uh, where exactly it's going to be in 2035, uh, I right. couldn't tell you. Well, the, the, the challenges I go back to, because when, when I heard the President say that and say the Union Address, I, my mind immediately went back to 1979, and I remember President Carter making a very similar statement, went and researched that and pulled that out. And in 1979, President Carter said, by the year 2000, 20 percent of America's electricity would be produced by solar power. That, that was the initiative in 79. Obviously, we are not at that point, and we are 11 years after that target. So we are going to have to greatly expand what is clean energy to be able to hit some of these targets we are talking about with this 80 percent number. It is an ambitious goal, sir, but I believe it is one that we can reach. Well, it is one that we have heard, obviously, before in 1979. And one, I, I'm, by the way, I am not against solar power or wind yeah. or all that. I hope my car runs on pinwheels one day. That would be great. But in reality, where we, what we really have is functioning traditional fuels. I am concerned that there is this push towards the green energy job to the detriment of traditional energy sources that could be successful in things. And let, let me just mention one thing, too. Our, our committee has asked for some documents on a subcommittee study that you put together on hydraulic fracking mm -hmm. uh, from the Department of Energy. Do you know when those documents are going to be complete coming back to our committee? Uh, I, I do know, sir. Some documents have been provided. Right. Some have. Just the, the complete set. Do you know when those are coming? Uh, I know that our staff is working with yours, and I am happy to look uh, talk to them when I get back to the Department. I am sure they are engaged, and we want to make sure uh, Obviously, there has been months in the process of their request that we would like to have that done. There, there are a lot of folks in natural gas industry that are very concerned about the number of studies and committees that are suddenly rising up right. on hydraulic fracking. Right. As Farron Hold mentioned before, in Oklahoma, uh, we have used hydraulic fracking since 1949. We have right. done more than 100,000 times we have fracked the earth in, in Oklahoma. We have great water, uh, beautiful land and air. And uh, so it is a great state to be able to be in for our natural resources there. And we have experienced what happens with natural gas fracking and with oil fracking. We have seen it. Uh, even you had mentioned in your testimony about since 1970, the Federal Government has been involved in, in helping with the fracking process and the technology right. of that. Our State Department currently is helping governments all over the world learn how to be able to frack. Well, at the same time, DOE and EPA and others are studying fracking to determine whether it is safe in here and how to regulate it more than that. So this push and pull between are we pushing green jobs so quickly and then studying and trying to put boundaries around traditional energy that we are going to choke off traditional energy and try to force the rise of green energy. That is part of my concern. If we are going to do all of the above, we have got to do all of the above and make sure that we are doing them all well. Uh, on that last point, sir, it is an excellent point. We have a prodigious gas resource we are getting from having only had one trillion cubic feet of shale gas in 2001. We are now uh, over a quarter of our natural gas comes from those tight shale gas deposits. The critical thing, as I think we all agree, is we got to make sure we do it in a way that is transparent and open so the American people can continue to have confidence in that prodigious energy resource. Correct. But we can, in the process, choke off investment in that area that suddenly there is a transition. Uh, we have got to be able to say, if it is there, it is there. Let us go after it. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, is recognized for five minutes. Six minutes or five minutes? Yeah, just one of the uh, trend. Only, only in the usual yeah. way, Mr. Tierney, in which the last question comes in with a half a second to go, <laughs> and the uh, the answer takes that minute, and uh, and I expect that will happen. Would you please reset the clock? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, I think you know part of what we're talking about here is whether or not this premise of the hearing is um, you know, whether a green agenda kills jobs. Uh, it, to me, it, it seems a bit of a uh, a uh, suspect statement, if not totally political. And I think we ought to really be asking whether or not investments in green energy are, are useful or not. And I look and I, I see that China seems to think that it is. Truth of the matter is that China is now uh, the number one. It's the highest public market for financing and clean energy in the sector. We're number three. We used to be number one. We're number three now behind China and Germany. Uh, China has secured $47.3 billion in asset financing in 2010 for clean energy projects. We had $21 billion. Uh, Sixty percent of all clean energy technology IPOs in the world in 2010 were from Chinese companies. China has created 16 national energy research and development centers intended specifically to drive innovation in the clean energy sector. By the end of 2011, national Chinese research and development expenditures are expected to rise 11 percent over levels earlier this year. And there has been a 600 percent increase in the number of college graduates in science fields in China uh, between 1995 and 2005. So the truth of the matter is that China certainly thinks of creating jobs and moving forward by investing in green technologies. Uh, as uh, Mr. Quigley stated, the Economic Council of the President, uh, Jeffrey Inmult, Norman Augustine, uh, Bill Gates, and, and others all down the line, 
they think it is an investment, that there should be some public support for what the private industry is doing. They asked for $16 billion uh, in general clean technology investment and asked for a specific $1 billion for the Energy Advanced Research Program uh, initiative on that. So there is a lot of people and a host of people that really believe that this is an investment worth making to support what the private industry uh, would do on that. And I think it is a, a shame that we are sitting here while China charges ahead, while Germany charges ahead, and we fall further behind. We are still arguing about whether making an investment in clean technologies is killing jobs, something like that. It, it just doesn't seem right on that. And, and I think we should investigate what the role of different people have been uh, in supporting this. But, you know, I just take a note in the, in the newspaper this morning, there is a bunch of articles in the press suggesting that 10 Republican members of our committee wrote letters to the Department of Energy praising loan guarantee programs. They were glowing in their terms. They were looking for funds for various projects in their district. So apparently nobody wants to pick winners and losers unless we can pick winners uh, in a specific district on that. Let me read from one of the stories. Uh, it is an article that ran last night in Energy Daily. And I quote, In one letter dated October 30, 2009, Representative Dan Burton, our colleague here, is the second ranking uh, Republican on the committee and its former chairman, joined 10 Indiana members of Congress to express his support for a loan application submitted by a bound solar. Are you familiar with a bound solar, Mr. Pullman? Yes, sir. All right. So according to your website, they got a $400 million loan guarantee under the exact same loan guarantee program as Solyndra. Is that true? The same program, yes, right. sir. Uh, and what your website says, the Department of Energy offered a bound solar manufacturing, LLC, a $400 million loan guarantee to manufacture state-of-the-art thin-film solar panels. The project includes two facilities, one in Longmont, Colorado, and the other in Tipton, Indiana. Is that, is that right? As I recall. So. Mr. Issa says that uh, doing things like that is a kind of a backdoor corruption. Do you think that a, a member sending a letter in support of a, uh, a, a constituent company uh, suggesting that they might benefit from a program like this is some sort of corruption? Let me be very clear, Congressman. We, I don't we, think it is. We, I don't we, know we always no, we welcome all correspondence from uh, Congress and, and treat it respectfully. However, when we are looking at these uh, uh, proposed loans, we analyze them purely on the merits. Well, one would hope so. On the one hand, we have those 10 members uh, putting in a letter and suggesting it go to their company in their district, and then the next time they are on Fox News saying the whole green thing is a scam in the first place. So I guess we will have to go to those members and decide which it is. I noticed that our chairman, Mr. Iser, who talks about this being a job killer and backdoor corruption, himself wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Department. And I just quote from the first part, I write to express my support of Aptura Motors. An application for a loan under the Department of Energy's 136 Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Incentive Program, ATV MIP. And later on there, he says that Aptera's project will also promote domestic job creation. So apparently, you know, on the one hand, we're having a hearing about whether we're killing jobs, but when it comes to a company in our district, uh, we're suggesting that they're going to promote domestic job creation if we make the right investments. So uh, I'd like to turn this hearing on the, you know, how do we make smart investments? like the President's counsel talks about, and how do we do that? And, Secretary Solis, when we make smart investments, if we're going to try to catch up to Germany and China, take advantage of all of our innovation in this country, uh, it would be useful, I would think, to have some people that can actually do those jobs. Is that correct? That's what we're hearing. Congressman, that's what we're hearing from the industry right now, that we don't have enough qualified individuals in this new technology. And so what the Department of Labor is doing, basically, is not creating the jobs, you're training the people for the jobs that are created. I've said that from the start. Right. And how's your record been on that? Well, we are now, for our $500 million that we have uh, received through the Recovery Act, we have already trained up 52,000. Our goal is about 96,000. So we are more than halfway there. And I would say our, our numbers are growing because these are three-year, two- and three-year projects. So you have to consider when they were, the startup began. So we're, I think we are on the road to, to slow recovery. And as soon as the economy and venture capitalists feel that there is a way to go, then I, see you're, I think you are going to see these jobs there. And we will have trained individuals ready for them. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just listening to the, the conversation here about whether uh, we are. Uh, but the gentleman was suspended. I, I apologize. We, I, I, okay, the gentleman will wait. Uh, go ahead, please. I'm okay, uh, just getting back to, to the subject, I was listening to Mr. Tierney, and we are talking about whether we are killing jobs. Uh, or, or are we creating jobs? Are we making smart investments? Uh, you have to forgive me. I come from the private sector, and I'm new, so I have a, a little bit of difficulty understanding how uh, government jobs are profitable. 
But, uh, Secretary Solis, uh, how many people with green job training have green jobs? The number of participants that have gone through, uh, what we are talking about here is 52,000 individuals that went through our green uh, job training programs. Not all of them have been placed in jobs yet, but many of them were incumbent workers currently employed and were upgraded, so they got other certificates. Okay. So you may just answer this. What fraction of the graduates of green job training program have since obtained green jobs? The per percentage, well, I will give you a, a number of individuals that have been placed in jobs. That is about 8,000. 8,000. Okay. Uh, how are people selected for green job training? Do people opt for green job training instead of normal training, or is this a government decision? It is not a government decision. As I said earlier, these are partnership grants that are based on market-based information. So you have businesses that will work in conjunction with, say, a community college or another individual group, and they will decide where the needs are based on facts and information. We then monitor that. It is a competitive process. We do not pick the winners and losers. These are individuals that compete uh, statewide and in some bases nationally. Okay. Um, you are familiar with the Davis-Bacon Act? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, a key part of President Obama's American Jobs Act is creating, to, creating jobs to rebuild or repair at least 35,000 schools. Uh, do you think that waiving Davis-Bacon requirements on cool, school construction has any merit? I think that uh, the Davis-Bacon Act was uh, provided many years, many decades ago um, through a Republican administration, and it was basically to keep wages at a, at a good, balanced level so they wouldn't be driven down with outside individuals coming in from, say, other neighboring states or other places. So I do believe that it does provide a, a good uh, quality of, of um, um, how could I say, salary for individuals in a competitive market? Yes, I do okay. agree. All right. Yeah, so you are familiar with the uh, uh, George Mason University study that uh, basically concluded that uh, su suspension of the Bacon-Davis Act or Davis-Bacon Act would have uh, created about 55,000 additional jobs federally because uh, the way they made their calculations um, they were paying on average about 6 percent higher than market rates? I am not familiar with the study. I know there have been um, individuals and, and uh, different groups that have said that Davis-Bacon may uh, have an impact in raising wages. Uh, but I would tell you that what our department does is, is a wage survey. So we base it on what the dip, that sector is providing in the neighboring areas, and we come up with a medium. That is how we base our Davis-Bacon rates. Okay. So do you think uh, green jobs to this point, the money invested, uh, as Mr. Tierney says, are we making smart investments? Or are we showing a profit to these government jobs? Are we They're making not money? government jobs, Congressman. I have to remind you that we don't create government jobs. We are actually helping to train individuals who will then be available for private sector jobs. Or if, say, they are working for local government, they may be hired up to, to work in that particular part that is green. So I am not a, the actual creator of a job. Okay. We help to train them. I think sometimes we focus so much on the fact that you know, unemployment rates are high and we need to create jobs, but we often spend a heck of a lot of money. We did so with the first stimulus, uh, and you know, we are staring at possibly stimulus two here. It reminds me of a story. I'm, I'm from southern Tennessee, right on the Alabama border, and there's a story about a, a farmer who uh, decided to sell watermelons at the market. So he found uh, watermelons just across the line in Alabama, and he would go load his truck up and buy the watermelons for a dollar, and he'd bring them back to Tennessee and sell them for 75 cents. And uh, he did that a few times and you know, clearly wasn't turning a profit. So came to the conclusion he just needed a bigger truck. And uh, sometimes when we look at these jobs, uh, you know, green jobs, and how we're uh, spending money, uh, stimulus money, in a, an incredibly high rate for a uh, overpriced, sometimes overpaid jobs, I'm just wondering if we are solving the problem of our debt crisis or if we're just making it worse. I had an opportunity to visit Tennessee almost a year ago and visited the Sharp Industries there and was very impressed to see the kind of training and the diverse workforce there that were involved in solar panel uh, development. And the owner of the plant, as you know, is, is from another country. However, their employment there helped to provide a substantial number of good paying jobs there. And I asked him, what will it take for you to continue to expand? Because we obviously want to see this industry grow. Um, and he said, well, what we'd like to do is, is be able to open up 
two or more factories, but we know that we have to, we have, to have a demand. Um, and so they were very interested in seeing expansion of that particular plant. But to see people who were in another industry that was dying because they were making plasma TVs and other things, now they were into solar panels. This was a job creator. And clearly, the, uh, the individuals that make the decision to, to create that industry there in Tennessee, where unemployment rates are very high, I think was a very good decision. Okay, but did you get any good deals on watermelons? I didn't ha stop to have one. I thank the gentleman and the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, my friend from Tennessee began by saying uh, he didn't understand how uh, public sector jobs could help an economy. And I, I find that odd, given that Tennessee has benefited from Federal investments in Oak Ridge and created actually incredible intellectual capital that have generated technologies and jobs and fostered an economy. To say nothing of, going further back, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which created jobs, was a strategic investment by the Federal Government and it transformed an entire region that allowed it to develop economically. Other than that, he is right. Public sector investment and public sector jobs make no sense. The premise of this hearing. Will the gentleman yield? 